to another episode of Launchpad TV. I'm Chris. And I'm Anne, and this is Life Style Business. All right. I love that uh, rhythm we got going yeah, there. We got, uh, we got it right. On the entry. You, you said it, you started, and I didn't have to prompt you this time. That was kind of a nice feature. We're off to a good start. Yeah, we are succeeding. Yeah. Nonetheless. Well, <laughs> Shout out to my one and only MIL out there. Glad to see you, Patty. Hey, Mom. Um, we have a great show today. Yeah. Um, we've been talking a lot about COVID and Katrina. We're kind of playing a game of like one of these things. Anyway, uh, we've been talking a lot about how the sort of situation we're in with the meltdown of the economy the collective stress of the nation being related to what we kind of went through back in Hurricane Creek, Katrina, correct? Yeah. yeah. And that is interesting because we also talked about the fact that that was, you know, obviously one city, not a whole nation. And this is very unique because everybody's getting through it. So we don't get to sort of like tune in for Oprah's special about Katrina and then tune out and go about our, our daily lives. I mean, that's what's unique about this overall is just the whole world is going through the same crisis at the same at time. At the same time, yeah. which is interesting. And so the thing about it is, is, is that we were also talking to our team today, which is like, you literally cannot be prepared for this. There's no like YouTube course that you can take to learn how to be a better business person during pandemic. I'm kind of prepared. You are prepared. That's because I prepared for the next fall's fires that are going to ravage the Sonoma Valley. Um, and so luckily we have yeah. masks. But you can't prepare, are, to your you point. You cannot prepare. Um, and there are no courses, and there is no education, and all the rules that used to exist um, aren't going to be at the bottom. And it's actually the ones who are going to survive are not going to be the ones that do it the same old way, right? So I'm sorry. For those of you writing blog posts on Medium, thinking that you're helping, you got to actually just help, right? Rebuilding is about doing the work. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's interesting, though, is we've been talking about how New Orleans and that experience in Katrina, which we talk about that a lot. Yep. The DNA of Launchpad is yep. you and also Katrina and the mm -hmm. rebuilding efforts. And what that does is it actually, it's interesting, they, and I say they because I never lived in New Orleans and I certainly wasn't there in a post-Katrina world or a during Katrina world. Um, but folks who did live through that do have a little bit of muscle memory. Would you agree with that? Well, I think it's, that's what is triggering for people or mem memories of that, those times and, um, you know, both in the crisis you know, sort of mode right now, and particularly our friends in New Orleans, the, the hunker down, but also in the, um, you know, the thing that comes out of it, which is the, how do we help? How do we come together as a community? Um, which is a great intro for uh, Travis, one of our guests that's going to come on uh, here shortly. In a few Might have been why us. I wrote it. Um, um, but yeah. yeah, bringing people together, right? Yeah. And um, the whole idea though is... Which is what we're trying to do. We are trying to do that. Um, but that muscle memory and that pattern recognition is actually what you need to say, all right, I've seen this before. I've got ideas how we can fix it. And that's why I'm really excited about our guests today. So both Travis and Scott, um, they are uh, by definition, <laughs> uh, Hurricane Katrina veterans. Um, they were both played roles in the rebuilding of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, and I'll get into that later, but we are just so excited to have them because I think uh, both we can be inspired by the models from before, but we can also be inspired by those leaders who are still stepping up and still getting, that's right, they're still getting into um, the process of rebuilding and they're there and they've got the energy and they've got the background and they're ready to rock. So we're gonna be talking to them today. But before, how was your Easter weekend? Uh, pretty good. It was wonderful. I spent it with you. <laughs> <laughs> we had a good Easter weekend. Um, we actually gave our team a break on Friday. 
uh, gave everybody off. Um, probably would have been more thoughtful because uh, to have given them a break, you know, on Passover, which many of them celebrate, and we probably should have thought about doing it on Passover rather than Good Friday. But you know, we got there in the end. Because um, well, I think part of that also just to um, talk about that for a minute is we've been during times like these, it's we're so emotionally drained and exhausted, and particularly if you're reading the New York Times or watching the news or, or on Twitter and. Um, you know, everybody's hunkered down going through it. And there's like periods of intensity and periods where you need to rest. But we've also been, you know, trying to, you know, create as much of an environment of, you know, opportunity for restoration and rest and um, wellness wellness uh, at this time as well. So anyway, a day, day off isn't much, but, um, you know, it was... Hopefully it was <laughs> well, well, well worth it. Anyway, um, we also, we did get to see Harper. We put her in our Easter dress, funnily enough, from last year. And we did a little Easter egg hunt, and that was pretty cute. We took some video. If those of you want it, just let us know. Um, but we also did a little test run. Um, Chris, basically on his day off, was like, I'm going to throw a, I want people to come to the club. Well, I was jealous of what Travis was doing. Basically, so I wanted to compete basically <laughs> he did not compete, collaborate. We have been super inspired by Travis and I'm not going to, we won't, we won't we'll ruin our, uh, our guest slot. Um, but we thought let's do a little Saturday night dance party. Um, and I don't know, we talked about zoom exhaustion and these uh, group cocktail hours and we thought an actual club party would be pretty fun, which was we sort of had playlists and an MC, and we did just a pilot. So don't worry, you'll all be invited in the future. But this time around, we wanted to get some of the kinks out. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell them a little bit about Club Cosmica? Well, the great thing about it, the whole thing was it was muted, <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know, all these, uh, you guys have probably been going to the Zoom happy hours. We're obviously doing Zoom right now. We have Zoom meetings, we're all on Zoom all the time. Um, but the one thing when you have a Zoom happy hour, a Zoom catch up is, it's basically, you know, opportunity for one person or, or family or, you know, one microphone to hold uh, court at, at any given time. So you have all this crosstalk and all this, and we wanted to create an experience that's more like being in the club, which is, um, you might be around other people and your friends and there's music playing, but you're kind of having your own experience and you're not always, you know, it's not a, it's not a meeting. You don't have to be interacting this way. So it was really fun. Um, we had a playlist, uh, that everybody synced up and was, was listening to. Uh, we learned from a Gen Z -er, uh, afterwards that there's actually an app for this. Uh, we tried to hack it together. Um, but that's Chris's favorite line is, did you Google that? We did not Google that before, so we will next time. But uh, people set up their webcams and, the, you know, by the pool, by in their living rooms, you know, it was pretty fun. It was pretty fun. Yeah. And we were just bringing this randomly up because we wanted to talk about this somewhat like quirky little dance party that we had. Um, but what was interesting about it, I'm going to bring up the three letters PPP. Yeah, you know me. Um, we talked a little bit about PPP last week. People are seeing if they're getting uh, their loans approved. Some people are still looking for bankers. More on that later. We've got a resource for you in New Orleans. Both um, two banks have come forward to say they are willing to support our New Orleans members and helping them with their PPP loans. They will not prioritize you against anyone else, nor will they do that for us either. Um, but we will certainly be able to connect you with folks, um, and we're going to be hearing so from someone from Iberia Bank, uh, Peggy, Thursday. is going to be joining us on Thursday, and she's also a fantastic lady. So wait, how are you tying the Why? dance party to PPP? Yeah, you, when you want to know. <laughs> so the thing about the PPP loan, here we go back to the dance party. So the only thing that did not go, not the only thing, but like the only real thing that didn't go super great with the dance party. Mm -hmm was we don't have Sonos and everybody else at the dance party or for the most, the vast majority of people have a Sonos. And for Travis up there, we made the fatal flaw of not including Marisol who formerly worked at Sonos to be able to help us with this uh, technical challenge. But basically we get on and people spend, you know, it's like the, I don't know how to 
actually get it to work was I don't know how to make my Sonos work. And because we don't have a Sonos, we couldn't troubleshoot, nor did we understand what the UI impact was. And so it was kind of a bit of a bummer. We figured it out, like listening to just whatever. We figured it out. It was fine. And people dropped off and people stayed on and it was like literally six people. So it didn't matter in the end. That's why it was a pilot. Why is that like PPP? Yeah. Well, when we found out about PPP and we were hearing from everybody, they're like, this is going to be amazing. We're talking to Rubio. It's going to get distributed through some local banks. And that way the banks will actually know the companies and it won't be a big BS process and they can move things really fast. And then we were like, but nobody has banker relationships in the small mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. landscape. And they're like, what? Doesn't everybody have a banker and a lending process? Yeah, let's try this. I think we can, you Pull can up put, that your, old... put your hand up as an attendee. I don't know if that works or not, but um, raise your hand if you have a relationship with a banker like a guy, a guy or gal, not a Sally the teller you know, that you know by a name. Banker. You know, we we have bank, we have relationships with ATM machines, right? We have relationships with a teller that we walk into, and so yeah. So first part of the process is you know we were scrambling, being a squeaky wheel, yelling at people, trying to get trying to get a banking relationship um, established, right? right? Just to try and get it go. And then, you know, most of these banks were not taking on new customers. And if they were, you were at the back of the line. Back of the line. And now, in addition to people getting the process for PPP is beginning, um, the other loan, the EIDL, um, has been cut. And so if you were at the front of the line, you got 10 grand as a grant. And I think I talked about this on the show. Um, and now it's, they've decided to do $1,000 per employee. Um, is, is what they're doing. So it, you know, a lot of the rules of the game are shifting, and um, I don't see any hands up, which means either uh, this doesn't work or nobody has a banker. We'll take it as nobody has a banker. Nobody has a banker. <laughs> We've done the poll before. Nobody has a banker. Yeah. But um, so that was my interesting thing is, is that they designed the bill with the goal and the objective of basically being able to have a huge impact on the small business community. And then what happens is. Sure, it benefits a lot of small businesses because if you define small businesses, it's like something like 500 and below. And for example, our winery friends uh, all have loans because winery is very capital intensive. But a lot of small businesses are not capital intensive. And so they tend to be bootstrapped. They don't tend to have uh, a lot of loans. And so that is how our Club Cosmico is similar because we didn't understand that a lot of people at Sonos to PPP and a lot of people, see how I did that? You landed that plane. I did, it took a while, probably could have gotten there faster, but we're a live show, so it's okay. So let's get going uh, and move on. All right. Uh, All right, we are gonna introduce our first guest. Travis Laurendine doesn't fit in the typical bio box, and that's not just because of his hair. As a serial entrepreneur, he has been on the cutting edge of both the web startup and entertainment industry for over 10 years. And I'm gonna actually say a few of these things because I didn't know a lot of this stuff, Travis. When Hurricane Katrina stuck, his, struck his hometown of New Orleans, remember we were talking about how Katrina is a good model for the current situation we're in? Uh, he stayed back in the city and found himself wearing the hats of startup CEO, concert promoter, restaurant general manager, stand-up comic, film and video producer, director, MTV news journalist, band manager, agent, investor, hackathon organizer, entrepreneur in residence, and cultural ambassador. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. I know, I just did a lot of things. <laughs> He's the founder of Louisiana's first hackathon organization, Codemakers, where he has organized hackathons for giant music festivals, jazz fest, Bonnaroo, and is currently running, running, and this is what we're here, he's here to talk to us about, the emergency response online music festival, Sofa King, that's raised over $120,000 since March 20th. That's less than a month. That's amazing. Hey. Jazz hands. Uh, yeah. Am, hey, I on, am I on air right now? Can y'all see me? You're on. You're on. Okay, yeah. hey. All right. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. 
I'm good. I took like two days off after um, the 504 Life show. And um, I remember what, you know, being a normal person is and like eating food at regular times and walking around outside. I ate crawfish. Um, oh my God. Man, and, we, uh, we saw that lineup for Saturday and we were like, yeah. Dang. So, and, and we have really good news is we're doing it again. Um, really? yeah, we did that in, we did that in five days, which is like, we, we weren't planning on doing another New Orleans benefit because we'd done a Louisiana benefit and it raised like 35, 40 grand for the Jazz and Heritage Foundation, which all that money went out today and they actually have extra money now and they're giving even more grants out. So we're super happy about that. And, but, and we were really planning on, you know, focusing our work on the musician relief. Um, you know, the, the goal number one was let's get people to stay home. Goal number two was let's try to go and rebuild some remnants of the of the music industry. Goal number three was let's go and build a more resilient music industry going forward. Yeah. Um, and Kevin, who I started uh, Noise with, has been he's just been way ahead of this entire pandemic. Yeah. Um, being actually in Asia, you know, all of the time, you know, being of of Taiwanese descent, he had an inside track. You know, he'd been sheltering in place. You know, he's on like day 45 or something, if that put, gives you a clue of how long he's been doing it. He was yeah. way ahead of anybody I knew. I mean, he has a certain certain family situation that, you know, makes them more at risk. And so he called on last Sunday night and got our, our team together and said, we need to go and do something. He'd already made a large order of PPE. And he said, let's go and bring the awareness up that this need is here because he felt like he was the only person who really was aware of the acute need. And um, in doing so, you know, we, we threw together, I mean, that to go and get those names that we got, Matthew McConaughey was someone who came in late, you know, Nicole Kidman and Eddie Redmayne, all these people, they all have, have experienced New Orleans and love New Orleans and wanted to give back. And now that we are going to do it again with so much more time, I think that we'll end up getting all of the rest of the people we didn't get and, and that many more. And the, the cool thing is that, you know, we got to learn this as like a startup thing is that we actually get to recycle the, the project, the, everything that we built, all of the emails, templates, all of the, the graphic assets, the overlays, all this other stuff um, we get to do again. And we essentially have like a digital Sanger theater. It's awesome. So, and you're doing it. I love that you're doing it in real time. Right. Yes. And we were, I tuned in on, I think maybe it was the first day. I don't, know, I don't remember, but I don't know if it was the first day or not, but it was, um, I saw Andrew Duhon and another, uh, the guy before him was, um, someone I can't remember, but it was awesome because he was like, sitting in his bathrobe in his living room. And he's like, well, I, I don't know, we're going to try this and see how it goes. And it was really interesting to see how he started to play. He went through his set. And at the end of the set, he's like, man, this was kind of actually really nice. Like, let's do this again. And like the experience you're giving to the audience, but also to the, the musicians is yeah. kind of a really neat way of like connecting in this time. No, totally. I mean, the musicians ended up reaching out to me, you know, because I have a way of like strong arming people sometimes. And I, um, you know, especially in the music business where, where people are like, hey, should we do this? And I'm like, yes, you should definitely do it. Here's a hundred <laughs> reasons why you should do it very quickly. And um, so, you know, a lot of a lot of the reason we were to do this is because I have personal relationships and I can get people to like go out of their comfort zone as a favor to me. And um you know, but the, the funny thing was that a lot of these people called me immediately after the shows and said, said, Hey, thank you for letting me do my thing again. You forced me into doing this, but once I started performing, I'm back in my comfort zone. They have, you know, the, that magical exchange of energy that happens that only performers really experience. And it's that high that they are actually always chasing uh, yeah. from the early shows. And so while, um, while we're talking about this, Travis, I just want to bring up, um, uh, and you can, you know, if you want to give me direction on where you want me to go, I'm, I'm showing the uh, Twitch uh, so Sofa King Fest site, as well as I've got your, your website up. But can you just kind of describe to the audience um, what this experience is? It's obviously a, a, a live yeah. broadcast, yeah. And, and just for, you know, it's so not let me, let me do the, right let me do the history. 
look yeah. at the history. I think that that's that's the important part. So, yeah. you know, I before before we started doing Sofa King Fest, you know, I started seeing everything cancel. You know, all the hackathons I'd planned canceled. Noise got canceled. We had to go and, and cancel everything. And so, um, some of some of my hacker three started hitting me up saying, you know, what what are, what are you going to do? What are we going to do? And honestly, you know, to to you know have a little personal note. I was not going to do anything. My friend died. I found him dead in his bed. I had to do a funeral for him. I had to throw a four day, a festival in four days for him. That was the pizza festival that we did. And I'm still brokenhearted about it. And I was going, and I left town to, um, to get away and to take some time. And I was going to not work for a period of time and you know, catch up and, you know, call, call a therapist and really deal with everything that was, you know, happened. And um, on my way to the beach, I'm at the beach right now. You know, it's like I've been working for 18 hour days from paradise, not, you know, sacrificing like going on the beach and doing normal things because I got a phone call from Reed Martin, who, you know, was one of our guests at Noise and is one of the, one of my co-conspirators in many different things. And he's also Big Frida's manager. And Big Frida had just suffered a massive blow to their their business, not to mention eventually getting sick and all these other kind of things that have happened. And essentially the call was, you know, Travis, we need you to activate. Whatever it is that we're gonna do, we need you to do it. And, you know, that phone call led to another phone call, led to another phone call, led to starting a Slack, led to, make some emails led to all of a sudden a team going up to, you know, at one point the team was like 45 people, at, you know, actively contributing. I was like, this is, this is the craziest project ever. Um, luckily, you know, we had just done a, a, a big Mardi Gras thing that had a lot of, you know, great people. This is one of the things about New Orleans is that we take care of people so well <laughs> that it's not really that hard to ask them to help after. And so a lot of the people who are helping were, had just been hosted in New Orleans for the Mardi Gras of their lives. And so it wasn't really that hard of an ask to get them to do it. And so we said, all right, what, what are we going to make here? And originally the idea was let's just make an online festival. And then we realized everybody's going to be making an online festival. What there needs to be is a directory, right? So when I, when I put on a show in New Orleans, I don't just put that show on my own website and for my own audience, I'm trying to get other people to discover other yeah. people to find them. So I put that that show on WWZ Livewire, right? And I put it on the the Offbeats directory, and I put it in the Nola.com directory. And so, for the live streaming guide, um, there wasn't really a directory. And and this week we're actually going to be launching the product. What people don't understand is that Sofa King so far, I've been putting on a clinic in Lean Startup. I don't know if people have really been noticing, but this has been a clinic, and this is like not a if we're not launching too you know, when it's, when it's, when I'm not embarrassed, I was fully embarrassed the entire time. <laughs> okay. Perfect. You know, the, the quote about, if the quote about, if, if you're, you're not if embarrassed, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I was embarrassed the whole time. Okay. And, and, and there's a lot of other people who were, saw that and didn't help us, even though they were asked to help because they care about other things besides the specific cause. And I'm not going to get into that. But, you know, it, it turned some people away. They're like, oh, you barely have this thing together. Well, looking at the results, if we, if we had waited, we would not have raised over $100,000 for musicians. And the only person who would have benefited would have been me and like right. our team and our egos. And really, we don't, there's no, there's no win there. I'm not trying to like, I've already done enough press. I've already done enough other things. I don't really care about that. I care about my friends who are screwed, who have taken care of me my entire career. People are like, why are you, you know, Travis, this is really good on you. I'm like, I'm just making up for all of the free shows I've been to for fucking 10 years. It's like, I, I have not, um, I'm not, I still haven't repaid the debt. I don't think I can ever repay the debt. And this is just what we do. And this idea, we didn't expect it to have like this incredible, the, the legs that it's grown. I mean, I have like inbound like offers of people who want to like turn it into a business and help us, which is, you know, what should happen whenever you get traction for things. And it's something that I've been complaining about in New Orleans for many years is that 
you can get traction for something and have zero phone calls. Yep. Which should not happen, you know? Like, well, honestly, I mean, honestly, maybe this is, this is the shot because, it, you know, you know New, Orleans, New Orleans is actually really good at music and live music. You know, yeah. you have the both background experience as well as, you know, the crew to put together, you know, sort of the, the technical platform. And obviously Kevin and Twitch are, you know, is a, is a, is a major asset. And, you know, you're, you're, you're out of the gate, you know, like you said, you're, you're lean startup in it. You're coming, you're coming fast. So just for, just for sort of the folks watching, um, uh, we, you, you did the big event um, on, on uh, Saturday, the 504 Live. You've been having shows, sort of, you know, book shows, um, but talk about, let, let's look forward, talk about what's coming up. Yeah. Um, that people can either watch or get involved with. I mean, mm -hmm. I think a lot of us are experiencing the same thing, which is like, you know, we were talking at the outset of the show, we, we had a Zoom dance party over the weekend. It was like, we're yeah. missing that live music experience. We're missing that. People are tuning mm -hmm. in to D-Nice. People are tuning in to DJs on Instagram Live. Um, mm -hmm. what, what is the experience that you're, you know, that you're creating for people? What, what, like if, yeah. if, you know, if you're watching right now, what, what, what are you expecting out of Sofa King? So, so we're, we're trying to go and make it so that you have a, we take the sum of all of the parts of all of the live streams that are happening in the world. And we're essentially an abstraction layer on top of that. Yeah. And we allow you to not have, like, if, if you watch, a video on Facebook, chances are you're going to end up seeing some political or family related or whatever stuff. You watch something on YouTube, the next video that's going to play adds some kind of rabbit hole you don't want to go down. Twitch, you're going to end up watching video game content or something else. So we're trying to create an abstraction layer that is a walled garden specifically for an intent, intent yeah. being for people who are trying to recreate a music festival experience from their sofas, which, you know, when you think about it, that's a VIP experience, right? If you can go and yeah. have multi cams, if you have your own bathroom, if you have your own food, you have all this other stuff. And where we're going is we're going is to, to bring that experience fully productized out into the, um, into the television. So the, the thing that we're launching this week is multi-stage, which is more like a festival, less like a show. So yeah. uh, if all of the different festival producers who are doing this stuff, we're giving them their own stage that you can go and click through and see, you know, it'll be three stages this week and eventually it'll be infinite stages. Um, so what we want is to give a place for all of the people who are doing all this stuff to go and be able to f find their fans and for vice versa for the fans who are trying to do this. So eventually there'll be like a blues stage. There'll be like a jazz, like you know, kind of, kind of like jazz fest, but also, you know, specifically like I was on the phone with Linda Perry last night, she wants to do her own stage for all the programming that she's done because a lot of people like the, doing live streaming stuff is not like some kind of crazy idea. It's the organizational thing around it. Yeah. You know, creating air traffic control is like the, one of the inbound people who, you know, hit us up was like, Hey, we want there to be an air traffic control for all this. And it seems like you're already doing it. And yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's what we're, you know, to look forward to what I see is like my bigger vision is, I want to have many smoke machines. I want to have many lasers. I want you to be able to go and in your, in your home, have this real festival experience where the TV is there, but there's, you know, the lasers, the hazers, all that stuff are like controlled by a real lighting director somewhere else. As oh as yeah. Future tech that we're doing, you sit back. And so in the post COVID world, you can still be doing this and it's still work. It's not just a COVID only thing. It's a, Hey, I don't, I don't like the crowds of vessels, but I like the music and I like, I will have 20 of my friends come over to my house and we'll, you know, have our things where we're watching this stage and this stage and this stage, or maybe they turn another room to another stage and you have to go to that other room to go and watch that's the Sahara stage. These, these kind of experiences, when you think about it, actually play into like the bigger things that we have post COVID, which is the environment, pollution, all the other things that are, that, we contribute to as a the music touring industry in the festival world and these are fixes for that and they're fixes for the revenue problems that every promoter is going to be facing because you know nobody knows when we're going to go back but then when we do go back 
you can, you're not going to be able to bet on like there being as many people willing to go to multi-thousand person events. Kind of go massively back to massive crowds, you know. The, it's, right, and, and, and now the independent promoters are out of business, so who's going to pay for your show? Yeah. You know, the, the entire independent touring market is, is built on independent promoters who put up the, the guarantees to make these shows happen. That's and right. now there's going to have to be software solutions for that, and, you know, that's that's – ultimately where my work is being refocused is helping make all of those other, you know, things happen because everything's going to change. And now people like me who really weren't listened to for, I mean, 10 years of my thing, it's like maybe people listen to like 1% of like the things that I had to contribute to the music business. But now all that 99% of stuff, everybody's all ears now. So it's a, uh, it's a good perseverance story for any entrepreneurs who are out there who feel like they are were ahead of their time or yeah. were not listened to by people uh, you know i talked to the head of bmg uh yesterday and the head of bmg was like you know you sound like the songwriters that we discover where they're like they have one hit song and then all of a sudden people are like well do you have any others and the guy's like yeah i have a hundred other songs just sitting here that no one's cared about for <laughs> all of these years it, you, you know so let's go and actually unearth them and that ends up being like the real gold for like a company like bmg where they're like wow this guy isn't just have one thing thing yeah. right so yeah. i'm loving where you're going you you are hitting on two things that we talked about at the beginning of the show which was this whole idea of muscle memory and it's like it basically you get the call mm -hmm. and travis can't say no he can't stay back he's like oh yeah <laughs> I need some time, guys. I got to take a break. I got to get my head straight. And all of a sudden the call comes and he's like, no, I'm back at battle. And I'm in battle and I'm in battle form and I'm just going to bust it out and go for it. That's A. B, I love the idea because this is the other theme is just because things have been done the way they've been done forever, right? The rules are off the table. Thank if you. If you are trying to do the same thing the same way, the same how, the rules have changed. We're all we're all thrown up in the air. Yep. Right? We got no, I got no option but to figure out how to survive, how to thrive, how to evolve, how to change, how to become the next butterfly. And like this is our time. And it's going to go to the people who are the innovators and it's gonna to go to the ones who are willing to Put some popsicle stick and tape. I said this to someone. I said the that the reality is, is that, that if it's the three of us putting popsicle stick and tape together, that's lean. We need to be lean right now. Mm -hmm. And we need to learn and we need to be able to take risks and your position to take risks. And that's why people are listening right now because we need risk takers and we need people who are actually making a big difference and trying new stuff. And, you know, hopefully I think the reality is we aren't all going to just go back. It's not like it's not no. like in three months um, any of these big organizations that have run huge music festivals that we all know move at massive pace and don't have any sort of stuck to their ways ways. It's not like they're going to morph into somehow this brilliant new online thing. We know how long that takes. We know how hard it is for them to morph. You're morphing and that's an inspiration to everybody else, mm -hmm. which is people, you've got to think about how you morph in your space. What is your next thing? And you can't be stuck on what it is. And so Travis, like, I think even the fact that you've got a vision on where it can go when we're all hosting dance parties at home, because it's like, we don't want to go to the concert, like that experience, being able to manage that offline and online experience is going to be so critical. And it's not going to be like, oh, we'll just do pay-per-view concerts. That'll obviously be the way it works. Yeah. That doesn't fill the void, right? Like it's yeah. not gonna go back to just, well, that's, that's the answer. You right. gotta throw it all up and I'm super excited that you're leading the charge and this is your time. Yeah, thank you so much. And you know, I, I, you're right, it's all about risk taking right now. And I've been, it's, it's hard for people to take risks. You know, like I'm actually very, you know, much a risk taker. So it's not, it's hard for me. But for other people, it's really hard and, and we have to go and help them realize that whereas in the, in the world that, w that was, there was more repercussions for your failure. In this world, 
I really don't see very many repercussions from trying to do something. I see more repercussions from not trying to do something. I, I've actually seen a lot of people who were, help, were asked to help who refused help to then go and do something on their own to try to get whatever else from it. And it, it's, it's really, it's a risk thing where they're like, we, it's too risky for them to help early. And what I encourage people to do is throw that out the window and help your fellow man and help as early and often as possible, even if it's awkward, even if it's not in your comfort zone, even if it's not the most perfect situation, because that's what, that's what it takes. We're in a wartime situation. There's actual people's lives at line and there's actual people's careers and businesses. And what we're about to enter is a, is a large period where the, the thing that we're fighting against is depression. People mm -hmm. are going to be very much depressed. Just not being around humans will make you depressed, much less all of the death, much less all of the isolation, much right. less everything else that goes, that goes around this. And so that's the, the thing that I would like people to start thinking of. And this is where like Sofa King Fest really sits in so well with that, is that music makes people happy. And, and for the musicians, we have to go and show up and contribute that part to go and bring people together, make them happy. And I want there to be more Zoom dance parties. I want there, you know, I had my own Zoom dance party situation. And, um, you know, for my, the person I'm quarantined with is his 44th birthday. And it was one of my few times that I went on Do Not Disturb this entire time and got to be like a consumer. And when you're, when you're dancing, you all of a sudden forget all of the problems, right? You all of a sudden are able to have that temporary thing. This is why second lines, you know, are so important in the city every Sunday is because when you're dancing the second line, you're not worried about, you know, your bills and your job and your problems, you know, whatever they may be. We need to go and provide that more and more and more. And it's ultimately like a, like a health service in, in that way. And we're going to be delivering mental health nuggets to people. And that's, you know, that's the other side. Like I was saying, when I, after we did it, people called me in tears, the musicians saying, this helped me, you know, some were calling because they looked at their tip jar and it was, it was way more money than they could have ever imagined. <laughs> I mean, the band Flow Tribe called me, you know, they were expecting maybe a couple hundred dollars. They had like several thousand dollars. That's from amazing! A, from, a, from a one hour show, you know, and like I'm on the phone with like, you know, Red Light and these other management companies. I'm like, have you heard of this band? They're like, no, I'm like, well, they did this much money. That's how much money this is happening. And these are bands that you haven't yet heard of. You need it. First off, you need to go and talk to these bands and manage them because they actually have real fans that are, that are customers here. Mm -hmm. but, you know, secondly, it's, you know, for the bands, like and they end up coming back saying, Hey, you know, we did this as a favor to you and you ended up doing us a favor. And it may, brought me to tears many a times because just that, that impact and that release of like, Oh, all of this craziness. I mean, y'all know, I don't really code for this project. I have been pushing code. Okay. <laughs> all right. I haven't coded since college. Right. And for this project, and like, I will do a little bit of code here and there just to help people at hackathons, whatever it is, this project's been so intense. I actually push the code. Okay. I'm sitting in term in the terminal, get <laughs> command, boom, bing, bing. I love it. These around. That's, that's how serious this is. And that's how like wartime effort we've gone. And uh, I mean, I, I couldn't be prouder to be able to serve, you know, the community at the time like this. Well, we couldn't have been prouder to have you on the host on the show. And I feel like the work you're doing, I feel like we're all at war together as mm -hmm. always. One of our values at Launchpad is we go long. Mm -hmm. um, and I just have to say you, Travis, that ever since I met you many years ago, you have been always the guy that shows up and does amazing stuff. And uh, we're, we're really grateful for you. And we really, are glad to be your friend and glad to see all the amazing stuff you do. And I can't wait to continue to cheer for your success. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your support and y'all were the first people to support noise.world and this Sofa King Fest really is noise.world. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's what we're doing. And so we appreciate y'all for, for everything you're doing. And, and honestly, kudos for putting this, this show together, um, bringing people together 
that's part of you know what what you all do and so to so to pivot into bringing people together online um, and helping us talk and connect that much more I'm you know I'm grateful for that all right well, well thank you Travis we're gonna we're gonna um, let you go it's really good to see you yes um, and uh, we, we uh, Ariel's put the link to Sofa King Fest and um, we'll keep following it, keep tuning in, and, and hopefully everybody else will. We might, we might might host our next dance party at Super <laughs> King Fest. Yeah. Obviously, let's go, let's we've go. already done the uh, the plan. Let's go to a festival. Yeah, and uh, let me and let me plug um, the the Rusty and Fanny show. One of the cool things yeah. that happened is you know different musicians, you know, who are people who are like really close to me were like, hey, so we're going to come up with our own show. And I was like, go for it, do it. And Tiff from the band Givers and her boyfriend who she's quarantined with have created a puppet music show called the Rusty and Fanny show. Yes. And the, the new episode is premiering on Sofa King today at six o'clock. So that's my plug for them. It is one of, one of the most amazing things I've ever seen to see somebody I know as a singer songwriter transition into a filmmaker puppeteer with no time, with no experience, and this show is just amazing, and it's just a testament to the amount of talent that we have. We're lucky to live beside here in Louisiana. That's, That's amazing. amazing. All right, well, good. Right. Uh, tune in, at, um, Travis. Alec had a uh, question, um, and maybe uh, in the chat room you can you can get to that. You can get to the question um, in the chat room if you but want. We're gonna, but we're gonna let you go now. All right, the, thanks, bro. Uh, next guest. Bye. <laughs> All right. You want to take this one? Yeah. All right. Well, uh, our next guest, as I bring him in, is um, somebody who uh, we've gotten the uh, the pleasure to get to know over the last um, what year plus? Uh, well, two years. Two years since Collision. Um, two years ago at Ecosystem Summit. Um, Scott Shallot, I'm a, I got a bio here. I, I think it's, Anne does a nice job with the bio. So uh, Scott Shallot was the managing director at Medora Ventures, um, a national public affairs firm and management firm that's worked with public and private sector leaders uh, on economic and social resilience, um, including Launchpad. Uh, he served as Mitch Landrieu's chief of staff during Mitch's first term as Lieutenant Governor from 2004 to 2006, and then has held numerous positions in government and business, former head of civic engagement at J.P. Morgan Chase. Let's talk about those PPP loans. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And uh, former senior advisor to the U.S. Conference of Mayors, uh, also a, uh, a good friend and um, important part of the, the Launchpad team. Uh, and this is going to be a fun segment. Scott is uh here to do we uh, we promise political commentary and just as the setup to this um we travel go on a lot of road trips together um traveling the country visiting potential launch bed locations or you know visiting mayors or, or whatnot and uh one of my favorite things is to let let go of whatever's going on in in life and work and sit there and uh, try, you know, sit in the passenger seat of Scott's Honda Pilot with him, and uh, and and talk politics. Uh, Scott is one of the most astute political observers, um, and uh, is definitely an in, and operator in, and op operator. But but in inside, you know, this is uh, inside the Beltway uh, insights. Um, so not just what we are all reading in the New York Times, but what's really going on. And uh, so we're excited to have Scott on the show today uh, and also for likely he's a also, recurring segment. <laughs> he's also the James Carville. Oh, so, is that the setup? You're the James Carville of this show? He's, no, he's the James Carville of our show. <laughs> it's okay. like... He, uh, your member, you're like Bill, and I'm like Hillary. Well, this is very typical because we haven't let him talk yet. <laughs> right. Are you gonna? Okay. So All right. Welcome, Scott. First rule of Fight Club is: Is it going to be a fun segment, Scott? I, sure. I'm not sure it'll be as fun as Travis. I'd rather be Travis, and think Travis should be thinking about how our politics goes. But yeah, I'm always always excited to be a guest on the Chris and Ann show to hear what Ann thinks. 
<laughs> Travis, by the way, is also, not only is he a musical wrangler, but he has been uh, politically wrangling on Facebook. He was a huge Bernie supporter. Um, and he, of course, in the current situation, now that Biden is our Democratic nominee, he has been accelerating his outreach to other Bernie supporters to get them to unite and to support the goal for getting Joe Biden into office. And I think that is another great testament to the fact that we have to always come together. We may not always see it eye to eye. We should have great, he was really a big uh, proponent as a Yang Gang member. Um, I always enjoyed seeing how Travis uh, was putting forth his sort of viewpoints around his candidates that were his choice, mm -hmm. um, but always in a respectful way. And now when push comes to shove, he is on the Bernie, uh, he's on the Biden train. That's great. I mean, look, I think all of us feel like first and foremost, we have to have a credible election. And we have to make sure that even in a post COVID world or COVID world that we'll be in in November, we're all able to vote and everybody's able to participate. Politics aside, it's important to the future of our democracy that that happens. Politically, when you start to think about this from a campaign perspective, we have to make sure that everybody who wants to vote to create a change in the current leadership at the highest level of America definitely has that opportunity to vote and comes together and unites around the fact that Joe Biden is our nominee and he represents solutions that now are an aggregation of all of the people who he ran against in the primary and offers something that we all need to get behind right now. And I was thinking over the weekend a lot about some of the similarities between to as you open the show hurricane katrina which at the time was right before the mayor's race was scheduled to kick off in new orleans and that mayor's race got postponed i don't want to postpone this presidential race that was gonna be one of my first questions do you think that is a possibility well i don't think it's so i don't think it should be um i think it shouldn't be first and foremost for what i just said the psyche of this country has to be that democracy can stand up to COVID and by November, we should be able to have an election in some form or format. And when you listen to people like Travis, as I was listening, I was taking a ton of notes. If he can figure out everything he's figured out, we can figure out how to conduct a safe, credible, fair election. We have eight, nine months. The election for mayor post Katrina was actually nine months from the date that Katrina happened which is the same amount of months from when COVID shut down, quarantine started to November. Mm -hmm. And people voted from across the country, mail-in, absentee. There were some places that faxed in ballots at the time. Of course, because I think that is something that you guys who experienced Katrina don't take for granted. Well, we had the that diaspora. Nine months, people were all over the place. People weren't back in New Orleans. Like, I think the rest of the country had moved on. We didn't realize that actually people were not in the city. Well, some were and some weren't. And it became an issue in the campaign used by the incumbent mayor. Now, I'll preface by saying I was involved very deeply in the challenger to that mayor, who was the lieutenant governor, who went on to become mayor, Mitch Landrieu. We did not win that race, but the challenger who was a first time office holder businessman who ended up going to jail for corruption who threatened to punch a reporter because he didn't like the way he was covered <laughs> who divided instead of tried to unite played upon the fact that there were some people who were back now you can think about this in a covid world what back means economically versus physically because we're not all we're all in our houses versus others who were not, and, and use that to really divide and, and, and play upon fears and anxieties that people had even nine months later. Well, how, how, so how, what, what other parallels can you draw, Scott? Because that, that is interesting that you say this. I mean, I think the... Um, so are you uh, telling me that, I'm sorry, my history, did Mayor Lander not win that? He did not. Not then, yeah, which, you know, we're... we're we're coming into a similar incumbent in office. Um, but um, the, 
from this point forward, um, do you think that this election is all about, all through the lens of COVID, all about COVID? I mean, all of those, you know, democratic debates that we had leading up to it, obviously healthcare is a, is a critical issue and, and very critical during this time, but, um, you know, is it, you know, is, is it, is everything including um, people's ability to get to the ballot box or, or mail in ballots and, and vote? Is everything going to be viewed through this lens of what we're, what we're all experiencing right now? So first election security was going to be an issue. The way we conducted the election to make sure that there was not either foreign or domestic or political interference in allowing people to vote was going to be an issue. We should be prepared for that at the state, local, and federal level anyhow, and we should be putting more resources behind it now because of the unique nature that may or may not exist in November regarding both the health of showing up and Wisconsin showed us a little bit about how to do it wrong uh, and not ensure that everybody can feel safe voting. But on all of the issues you just talked about, all of the issues that were debated, the answer is absolutely yes and absolutely not. It's all going to be looked at how we deal with the climate, how we deal with the economy, how we deal with healthcare, how we deal with the delivery system of education is all going to be looked at now in a post COVID environment. We can't not. I mean, we are always going to be post COVID in America, just like every hurricane season post Katrina raises some level of PTSD for all of us in New Orleans who went through it. I mean, I was reflecting to, I don't think it was with your team, but with some team the other day about 2011, Karen and I had already had our second son. We lived in DC for four years post our move after Katrina back to, to DC. We were on vacation in New Orleans and there were, um, the boys were I think four and two or five and three at the time. Hurricane Irene was threatening the Chesapeake Bay and the coast. We cut our trip short to come home out of fear that if the hurricane did hit landfall two day, two three days later, the boys might have to evacuate and we wouldn't be able to get back. And so that PTSD is real. And that PTSD for all of us will be real every season and in everything that we have to do until we learn that, like what Travis is doing, we've all figured out new ways. And that goes for the government too. We figured out new ways to provide healthcare with telehealth in a better way. We figured out how online learning is a complement to public education to help people, which then gets you into like, we can't do that if we're not investing in digital divide in rural and poor areas. Mm -hmm. So every, if, if I were running Joe Biden's campaign right now, everything that we talked about and everything that all of the other candidates talked about, I would go back and look at it and say, how are we going to meet that moment that people have to show up to the ballot and offer them our vision of what we're gonna do moving forward in this post COVID environment, but acknowledging that from the way the economy was working, it wasn't equitable before. From the way we were acting as uh, leaders, we were allowing divisive tactics, the way that we deal with the media. And so we have to kind of recognize that the psyche and the ability for voters to show up and say, I want something that feels like it recognizes this new normal is crucial for my campaign. And it's not just Biden. There's 35 Senate campaigns right now, 12 Democrat and 23 Republicans. There's a handful of governors. Every congressional member is all up on the ballot in November. You know, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. I got you, you know, he dominate, I may dominate a lot of things, but he dominates the interviews. But interestingly enough, here's my question. Um, I think the Democratic Party has often been challenged by the breadth of perspectives and the nuances of policy, right? And so, um, whereas the Republican Party, and I'm brass tacks here, but the Republican Party has a tendency to um, be very focused on one end goal and figure out what is that, uh, whatever the issue is, it's going to be that lightning issue to get people to the ballot box, to get people to vote for their guy, to get people there, right? And that, that might change depending on the region you're in, the, the voting type, but they're very willing to do that. Um, this is interesting because this is 
galvanizing and catalytic moment. And what we saw in New Orleans and the change that we often talk about is you didn't, and the entrepreneurs of the New Orleans ecosystem came in and said, we don't want to build it back the way it was to old timey steer sucker suits, right? We want to build it back to, we want to build it to where we want it to go. And to create this equitable sort of approach to entrepreneurship and be able to be more engaging and more inclusive and all those things. I would argue that the moment the, be that moment for the Democratic Party. Well, I would argue that the Chris Schultzes of the world in New Orleans did that, but that was not right after Katrina. The and I don't I hope I don't want to offend anyone, but, but there were plenty of seersucker suit type wearing. Yeah, we're going to need help from New Orleans. <laughs> in New Orleans who, not watching. <laughs> who, who at least in the immediate aftermath, were all feeling the same anxiety we felt regardless of where they came from zip code wise neighborhood or financial means and just wanted back what they had. And that got translated to, I need to get back what I want and need before others do. And those who have more always do better quicker. And we're all recognizing that. I mean, I'm, you know, as much as Chris says, talk about JP Morgan Chase when you work there, I'm in the same boat every entrepreneur is with my biz, my public affairs business right now in a weird way, because I was, I had a personal relationship with a banker based on my time at JP Morgan Chase, who now won't pay attention to me because my business is not big enough for the bank classification I was in as a senior manager, you know, managing director at the bank when I was there. So I have to start a new relationship with a new banker anyhow, even though I have a relationship with a very good banker. And, and yeah. for purposes of who might be watching this, that banker that I have is great. And he does everything I need. <laughs> um, um, all right. So, but to the point in is yes, once we got in the city to a place where we were able to look at everybody and say, how do I make sure that those who want to be here and those who are contributing to a future that we can all be part of, we ended up turning New Orleans, New Orleans had a new normal, right? Or built instead of rebuilt. The question is nine months from, where will that economic anxiety be? And will Joe Biden be able to unite the d disparate or, or diverse perspectives that he has to make sure that are all fitting under that umbrella in the democratic side which is a challenge we've had way before COVID versus a scapegoat artist who will try to divide because it's in his nature. Let me do a couple speed round um, because it, it, it is timely here. Um, a lot of economic anxiety right now um, from a personal perspective, a lot of people losing jobs, highest unemployment rates we've ever seen in our lifetime in terms of new filings, um, businesses that might, you know, typically, you know, be small business owners that would vote for lower taxes, um, now have their hand out for loans. I mean, next time I hear a a business owner, you know, say to me, oh, well, you know, all of those entitlement programs. I mean, these are entitlement programs for businesses, right? So that's, that's what we're dealing with. But there is a sense of like, okay, the government should be providing us some safety net. They're not letting us go to the office. They're not letting us work. They're shutting down restaurants, right? So UBI, is, is UBI's time now? Can we have a realistic discussion? I mean, did Yang put it on the radar at the right time for us to have a, have a real Absolutely. discussion about it? Absolutely. I would argue that everything's time is now. I mean, I would argue that right now we're living in the biggest moment of social behavior lessons that can become the longitudinal study for the anxiety that people feel for the way businesses are evolving and result and respond to this that will tell us policy lessons, that will tell us investment lessons, that will help rebuild the infrastructure of how this response evolves over time. We're only a couple weeks into this, right? If this were the Katrina analogy, we water would just be residing. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. we need to think about the fact like between now and the election, there's time going to be time for all of that to be hashed out and debated online, hopefully somewhat in person, politically with all of these campaigns, but we're also going to go through 
do we open back up for the summer and are we allowed to take our summer vacation because A, can we afford it? And B, will communities allow us? And that impacts the psyche of what we go through as a voter. Schools, for me, my seventh grade, now seventh grader is gonna go back to eighth grade. I wanna know, did the federal government help prepare his, the resources that they need to readjust their curriculum? All of that like has real profound policy uh, impact. If schools had testing guidelines that changed the formula to the way the schools tested to what kind of funding they got from the state, that all is out the window now because those tests didn't happen this year for next year's funding. So there's a lot of sort of blockchain like things in policy and politics that are out there. All I can say is every bit of rhetoric that exists out there either masks or offers a solution that we should be considering because what we know when we think about everybody we hear on Launchpad TV and any business, what you guys are going through, what Travis showed us is entrepreneurial ship is going to win and there's no reason why the government shouldn't be just as entrepreneurial with the factors that we're learning from what the community is telling us. So the problem with that, we're all like, think about all of our Google searches and all of our time where we are right now creating the, the data to show community leaders at national, state, local level, what we need them to be responding to. So, so the only thing is, is when you say that, which is like, well, we need an entrepreneurial mindset. You know, many would say that the individual and in, uh, the president today has an entrepreneurial mindset. He's willing to throw shit against the wall and fi figure it out. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that's the, the program, but I'm saying, what should Biden do? What's the first thing that he should do? Because attacking the current president isn't, isn't the reality, right? Like, what is he going to do? And, and what's the move here? So first and foremost, just politically, Biden has access to a much bigger, broader, diverse team that has time to go think about this from an entrepreneurial standpoint to both communicate, campaign, and gather more information. Because he's got a whole list of Amy Klobuchar, Cory Booker, Andrew Yang, Pete Buttigieg. With passionate audiences. Passionate audiences with structure that he could deploy right now. It doesn't have to be his cabinet, but it could be sort of a kitchen cabinet of people who are all out there talking and learning and bringing back, who have frankly probably more credibility on this than somebody who spent 35 years in office, but he can build that and take that credit, leverage that credibility as the leader of that organization. That's what the most entrepreneurial CEO would do. Second, he has to distinguish himself from the guy in office who might be seen as entrepreneurial but is also seen as selfish. And survey mm -hmm. all of your entrepreneurs from your impact report and ask how many of those who focus more on themselves than the customers they served ultimately were successful and had the impact that they, they or we were the most proud of. Yeah, so customer first. And do you think, is you know Biden personally, do you feel like he can actually back up the ego enough to allow the breadth to win? Yes, I do but I don't think that he can do it alone. And I don't think anybody should. It's, you know, I, I was on the Biden train way before the train got to COVID or everybody else got out because I thought he was the closest we had to somebody who had been in that seat before and we needed somebody in that seat to restore credibility. That having been said, I don't believe anybody until they actually are in that seat, can do that job, or knows what it's like to do that job fully. And while he might be the closest, none of them, nobody who does it successfully does it alone. Yeah. That's being proven out in spades way before COVID now. All right, I'm gonna launch a, a poll here while I ask you the next question. And then let, let's get uh, you know, some question, Q and A coming in from the audience uh, that, that's interesting. Um, let's get to a few of those. but. I'm gonna launch this poll for everyone while I ask you the question, Scott. Let the audience know when they ask questions, Anne is gonna to answer too. So pose, pose the question to who they pose it, want to, want to answer. Right. That's why they're asking the question. All right, uh, <laughs> Biden's VP pick, here we go. Who, uh, who do you like, Scott? Um, well, it can't be Barack Obama. Is that, constitutionally, is that true? 
I don't think constitutionally he can. It could be Michelle, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Um, without getting into the fact that he said he was going to pick a woman. Um, I don't, I, I'm going to recuse myself from this one because I'm a little bit biased when I'm looking at that. <laughs> uh, I think I got a, a Elizabeth Warren, Amy Klobuchar. Um, uh, AOC has been talked about uh, at least today. I don't know if that's been, you know, um, Kamala, obviously. Um, Anyway, interesting. Uh, I think, uh, oh, Stacey Abrams. I, I left her out. Yeah, she's... Uh, yeah, I mean, Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan's being noticed. Uh, I, I, just because, and you guys know my politics tends to be at the state and local more, I think that chief executive, I mean, Joe Biden doesn't need what Barack Obama did and needed in Joe Biden, which is, or Bill Clinton needed in Al Gore, which is somebody who comes from the Senate, because then you would think of youth. a Omichar or Harris. He does need youth. I mean, I would put Pete, Mayor Pete on there. Mm -hmm. I would put, Cor but you know, I don't see Cory Booker on there either. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't scrolled all the way down. Uh, you know, uh, if, given the conversation we're having right now about Hurricane Katrina, and I am biased, and he would not want me to offer this, I would say Mitch Landrieu probably deserves a, a real look now. Um, I think, but you know, given this list, I probably think that it would be important to pick somebody like Kamala Harris, who represents a number of different things in the demographic diversity that Ann mentioned about being inclusive, both from a minority as well as a woman. I mean, I just think you have to be thoughtful of the symbols too, especially given the anxiety folks are going to feel about wanting to see themselves in their leaders. Yeah. So I got a question here from the audience about Biden. And I think that this is one of the challenges when you have a long story career. We saw a similar situation with our friend Hillary. Um, but how about Biden work a bit for social justice to free some of the millions of folks whose policies have locked up? Would you like to comment on that, Scott? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that's, first off, everybody has who has a long career is going to have more that you dislike than what you like in their record. I think that me, except Dan, uh, but not every, I mean, you know, if, if you could run for president and we wouldn't even be having to have this show. <laughs> um, and I could really be Jim Carlo. Uh, not that I've ever aspired to that. Um, the, I think that the, 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 the fact that he's got such a long record also indicates the fact that a number of these issues have transferred over time with, with, with where the society has gone. And I think that it's important to give him a little bit of a room in this current situation because it's so crucial that we get rid of who is in office, in my opinion. Um, because he's at least exhibiting the interest even at this stage in his career to continue to listen learn and have a more diverse team and i think in the covid post-covid environment that we've spent the time talking about here all of that is even more key because our ability to respond our ability to now really recognize the fact that like we don't survive if we don't have the capacity as a community in even every community in the most vulnerable communities to operate conduct commerce learn etc be online that we need people coming on board and helping explain more about all of these issues and explaining more about what we can do and holding him to a 1990s crime bill vote that I worked for the mayor of New Orleans at the time, who was Mark Morial, that he was for, you know, is, is sort of not necessarily the way that I would want to go into this election, knowing what we have before us, not behind us. Fair, fair commentary and well put. Uh, and as you said, um, when you have a long track record, um, there are things along the way that you know you're going to be held accountable for. So um, yeah, he's he's being held accountable, and uh, you know it, it you know it's a it's a question that can be raised. But um, you know the question is, is that the most important thing that we want to tackle well, I mean, right now? Quite honestly, I think this is the failure of the Democratic Party, which is the reality is, is guess what? I would have much preferred that we would have, as a collective folks, voted for someone and selected someone that 
was going to be here 50 years from now. Yeah. Right? yeah. And we're going to be making policy decisions 50 years from now. We didn't have that option, right? We had, and no offense, we had Warren, we had Bernie, we had Biden, right? Yeah. The establishment did hold it. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. Well, I think you um, But I do think, you know, this, this was our shot. The thing about it is, is that, that now that we are in this pandemic, now that actual experience and that experience with Ebola and that experience with Obama and that experience in office is actually what we're craving. Well, guess what? Somebody who also has spent his life working with world leaders and knows how to navigate the global economic and yeah. political atmosphere, but that doesn't minimize the question. Hold him accountable. He's shown his ability to learn. Holding him accountable, you know, you, you sort of tee me up for a piece that I'm writing that I'm trying to put out there. A lesson Mitch taught me, focus on the problem, not the person. If you believe Joe Biden should be better on an issue, you're really thinking like, so should all the Democrats, so should the country. There's nothing partisan about doing stuff the right way. It takes partisan victories to get people who believe certain things to do it challenge the issue but it's not going to do any of us any good if we don't get them elected so right don't break the, don't break down the person right break down the issue exactly right. i know we're, we're going on but this is fun so i got one more and then i'm gonna i'm gonna pass it to you to uh ask a question oh, or wrap up am I gonna do the one minute wrap up? you're gonna do the one minute wrap up and you you you've got i'll get ready i'm gonna get if ready. you've got a question and you go ahead all right so, Cloud are known for one minute <laughs> All right, this is sort of back to the speed round, but you know, take, take as much time, but I wanna do the, sort of the setup here. So obviously under the, the lens of COVID, all of us you know, staying at home, um, you touched on the how will we be voting, um, you know, a lot of the, you know, whether vote by mail, you know, and, and there's clear you know, that, that helps you know, one party, not the others. I think that's sort of well known. Um, uh, also now, um, you know, there's some, uh, you know, Governor Newsom calling California a nation state and coalitions of states coming together, um, you know, both on the West Coast and, and the East Coast now and in real centers of commerce and, center, and population centers, um, you know, economic engines for the country. Um, uh, you know, this is, this is a scenario where, you know, you know, Trump can't kind of have it both ways. And on one hand, he's like, governors, you're on your own, you know, battle it out for PPE and, and whatnot. And then yesterday he says, you know, wait a second, you know, I have all authority in a circumstance like this. So are we gonna experience some sort of a constitutional crisis over the next several months or leading up to this election? I mean, like, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of like, if you look at the course of some of the, these events here, um, it's worrisome, right? You want me to answer that in one minute? <laughs> no, you got all the time you need. I don't think we'll have a constitutional crisis. Okay. More than we have already, which is the constitution is constantly in crisis and challenged to explore the balance that it creates between the right to bear arms and public safety between a whole bunch of issues that exist. Um, so I'm completely energized and excited by these packs. I don't think that the political jurisdictions for policy, economic development, transportation, et cetera, really matter other than for who we elect our leaders and where we pay our taxes, et cetera. And so it's important to have state structure and county structure or parish structure. It's important that we have that, but like we should be able to see a governor Newsom working with Republican governors, mayors and others from a bigger region, the same way we saw, we could see across the Gulf Coast regionally ways that we can organize well beyond the COVID response to conduct the essential services of government that don't necessarily require those boundaries. 
while also staying true to the structure that has to exist for the what the boundaries need to be there for from policy some certain policy thing um i don't think any governor is going to want to be responsible for potholes or trash collection right mm -hmm. but um so ultimately well beyond the election that's exciting as people unite behind coordinated tables of organization in multi-state regions governors voices may become more effectively progressive and moderate and the fact that like by sheer force governors who don't share the same political will or party may be working together in a closer way where they're able to focus on solutions and not people and help yep. talk to their electorate about who, how much it matters when somebody who sits in office. And anybody who's been through Hurricane Katrina or now COVID knows it really does matter who's in office and what they're not just politically doing, but capable of doing in order to manage a response. I mean, I would argue that the business relief package, which was really good, is way too slow to actually meet the needs of rent being due mm -hmm. or payroll having to be made. So what good is PPP, three payrolls in, if you have to keep your employees on the payroll in order to qualify for it right like thinking about all that stuff now because we couldn't have thought about it beforehand or we should have you know helps us through the next one but helps us understand what the constituents were elected to represent need lastly on the election specifically i think you're asking like i think we have to do everything we can to conduct the election i don't know all the answers to how every secretary of state and local office can do it. But I think what I would call for right now is a national election monitor, and it could be a bipartisan or a nonpartisan. We send monitors into foreign countries to monitor, to look at, watch, oversee elections all the time. And I would just agree that it has to vote. Health officials have to be involved in it because people have to be able to show up to vote if they're healthy uh, in a healthy situation. Everybody who has the legal right to vote has to be able to cast a ballot and security has to exist to make sure that those ballots are, are voted. If we start with that criteria, we'll figure it out. We just have to start with like all being on the same page about the fact that the election has to happen. And those are the things that we have, it has to be conducted in a fair way for everybody based on those criteria. And then we, then we don't debate the politics of the election, we debate the we, we get into operationally, how are we gonna conduct the election? And that's where we need to be. And if Donald Trump doesn't wanna do that, Joe Biden should start talking about that and all Democratic candidates should to at least get that conversation going. Yeah, drive that, drive that home. Well, I know for one thing for sure, Iowa's probably not gonna be in charge of the voting process. Well, I, I, I was- I Maybe was, they should be because they learned a lot. I learned a lot. I in my heart for Iowa. I went to college in Iowa and worked for Al Gore in the Iowa caucuses and felt bad for where they were, but it's... That was a bummer. That was a bummer. Okay. Let's say that. <laughs> a, I think we can agree that it was a cluster. We can still like them, but it was a cluster. Yeah, but nobody today is worried about what happened in Iowa. They want to get us out of this situation. Here, I hear you. Okay, well, thank you uh, to our guests today for Launchpad TV. We yeah. are delighted. Uh, next Thursday, uh, in two days, we will be hosting Brian Zisk from Music Tuck and Peggy from Iberia Bank. And I should have Peggy's last name at my fingertips, and I don't. I apologize, Peggy, but we are going to be hearing about what Iberia's got uh, for the small business community in New Orleans and beyond. Um, and a huge thank you to our guest today, Travis uh, from Sofa King Fest. He is really demonstrating the importance of, at this time, hearing the call, answering the call, being creative and scrappy and not worrying about your image, worrying about your impact. And Scott, who's our inside boots into the psyche of the political movement that is the Democratic organization, giving us a little bit of tips mm -hmm. on how we should think about where we are in a post-COVID world, how we can move forward and not necessarily look behind. And I love Scott's message, which is one for the political world as well as the business world, which is focus on the issue, 
not the person. Thank you, Scott, thank you. and thank you, Travis. Looking forward to it. And for those of you who want to tune in for Wine Down Wednesday in the morning, new time at 5 p.m., we'll be hosting Noah Dorrance from Reeve Wines right here in Healdsburg, California. This is Anne and Chris. Thank you, guys. See you soon.